Okay, good morning again, everyone. Good to see you here in uh, the Lord's Day at, at CCC worshiping with us. It's a joy to have you guys. If this is your first time to CCC, my name is Tazar, one of the elders here at Covenant City Church. And uh, today, we're going to be continuing in our sermon series through the book of Luke. So the past month, we've been talking about uh, our mission month. We're going through our mission month where we take a passage in the Bible that specifically talks about missions. And uh, we preached on that and also informed you guys and hopefully connected you guys to all the mission efforts that we were doing here at CCC. But now we're going back to our larger sermon series through the book of Luke. And today, we're going to be picking up where we left off in Luke chapter 9. Okay, and the passage that we're on today in the book of Luke is in many ways a turning point in the book. Okay, so the previous nine chapters, Luke's mainly been talking about the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is. From here on out till the end of the book, Luke is going to be focusing more on what we must do as his followers to follow him. Okay, so if Luke chapter 1 to 9 is about who Jesus is. Uh, chapter 9 onwards is about how we're supposed to follow Jesus. And the way Luke begins this conversation, I find very interesting. Okay? Luke uh, doesn't start here in chapter 9 by immediately telling us what we must do in order to follow Jesus correctly. What he starts off with is he tells us what we would feel if we're following Jesus correctly. Okay, so in other words, he doesn't start with form, but sensation. Okay, picture someone in the gym trying to do bicep curls for the first time. Okay, they've never done it before, they don't know how to do it, so they're kind of swinging the dumbbells everywhere, their form's off. Okay, and the trainer goes, whoa, 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 hold on, that's not how you do it. This is how you do it, if that's how you do it, I don't know. But this is how you do it, okay? Uh, and then they try again, but their form's still kind of off because it's their first time doing it. So to help them get rid of the wrong form and do the correct form, the coach now switches from talking about the form to the sensation. The coach goes, okay, okay here's how you'll know that if you're doing it correctly. Um, you know, you'll know that you're doing it correctly if you feel a strain or a pain right here. Okay, that sensation tells you that you're doing the right thing. If you don't feel pain here, if, if, if you feel pain in your shoulders or in your back or in your wrist, that means your form's wrong, right? You, if you feel pain here, that means you're doing it right. In some way, this is kind of what Luke is doing here. He doesn't start with form, he starts with sensation. He's saying that if you follow Jesus correctly, you know what it'll feel like? it'll feel like you're denying yourself every single day. It'll feel like self-denial. If you feel the strain of self-denial, that means you're doing it correctly. And if you don't feel the strain of self-denial, that could mean you're not doing it right. Okay, but what does self-denial here actually mean, right? Because other religions preach self-denial as well, don't they? They say that if you deny God, I mean, you deny yourself and you obey God, you're going to get rewarded. Is that, is that what Christian self-denial is? Is Christian self-denial the sort of moral improvement program that kind of makes you play trade with God? You know, if I deny myself and become a better person, then he'll reward me. Is that what Jesus means here by self-denial? And what is it we're actually called to self-deny anyways? Okay, must we reject everything that our souls find even the slightest flavor in? Is Christian self-denial this sort of monk-like disposition that we often see out there and or associate with the idea of self-denial? And the answer is no. Though there may be slight parallels, foundationally, Christian self-denial is completely different than the other kinds of self-denials that we see here in this world. And, and seeing that difference, okay, between Christian self-denial and every other form of self-denial, friends, might just be the ticket that'll help our hearts be less resistant to it. And by God's grace, shape us into more obedient followers of Christ, okay? 
Let's get into it. It's God's word. Take it from Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 27. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others uh, that one of the prophets of the old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in glory, in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. <clears throat> but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Thus says the Lord. Okay, let's take a look at what's unique about Christian self-denial. And, and in order to see that, we've got to see at least four things that Jesus expects of his disciples here in this passage, okay? First, we see Jesus expecting his disciples to see his true identity. Second, to realize their sinful intuitions. Third, to quench their impulse for power. And lastly, to understand what'll happen if they don't. Okay, let's start with the first one. Jesus expects his disciples to see his true identity, who he really is. So, our passage starts with uh, Jesus and disciples praying alone, verse 18 says. And as Jesus was praying, he suddenly stopped and asked his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, Jesus, uh, he wasn't being insecure here, okay? He was trying to create a teaching moment for his disciples. And they answered him, well, the crowd's been saying that you're John the Baptist, Elijah, or some kind of Old Testament prophet who's come back to life which would kind of make sense because everything Jesus has been doing up to now were all the things that Old Testament prophets would do, right? What would they do? They would preach God's word boldly. They would heal diseases and uh, resurrect people from the dead. Even Elijah once did that in First Kings chapter 17, which is probably why the crowd here thought he's probably Elijah. Um, Old Testament prophets would rebuke people of their sins. Jesus did all these things. So they thought he's probably a prophet. But then Jesus asked his own disciples, okay, that's who the crowd says that I am. Who do you think that I am? And Peter responded, you know what? I think you're more than that. I don't think you're just a prophet. I think you're the Christ of God, meaning you're the promised king, you're the long-awaited Messiah uh, who would come and save God's people. And he's absolutely right. He's correct. Uh, because you think about Jesus' story up to now, he didn't just preach God's word boldly, right? Remember what he said in uh, Luke chapter four in the synagogue? He didn't just preach the scriptures, he said that he was the fulfillment of what? Of the scriptures. Well, that's, that's an extra step, right, than all the other prophets would say. And okay, sure, he raised uh, someone from the dead like Elijah did, but if you remember, unlike Elijah, he didn't have to do tons of elaborate, exhausting rituals to do it, he just simply said, get up, and it happened through the power of his word, much like what God did when? In creation, in Genesis 1. And he also rebuked people for their sins, but he goes beyond that, and he forgives people of their sins, something only God gets to do in the Old Testament. So Peter noticed all that, and he said, you know what? I don't think you're just a prophet. I think you're the one. I think you're the Christ. I think you're the Messiah. And immediately after Peter says this, Jesus in verse 23 says, good, don't tell anyone. It's like, wait, why? Why should Peter stay quiet about Jesus' identity as Messiah? And if you think about it, this isn't the first time Jesus has done this, right? We've seen Jesus do this multiple times in the book of Luke. 
uh, in the demon-possessed man in chapter four, when he healed the leper in chapter five, every time they said, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, good, but don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone, keep quiet about it. Now, why would Jesus do that? Because, friends, there was an expectation about the Messiah at the day that was actually totally different than what Jesus came to do. It was different than Jesus' mission and what he wanted to accomplish on earth, which leads us to our second point, where Luke shows us here the sinful intuitions we all have through Jesus' request for silence in verse 21, okay? Jesus wanted them to realize their sinful intuitions. Don't, don't say anything about it, because there's something wrong with that intuition of yours. Okay. See, everyone back then, even today perhaps, everyone expected the Messiah to come and do kind of like what Timothy Chalamet did to the House of Harkonnen in the Dune movies. Okay? You haven't seen it? Go watch it. It's a good movie. You know what I mean? The long-awaited Messiah finally comes and destroys the bad guy with desert power. <laughs> you know? Um, but for them, the enemies wasn't House Harkonnen, it was the Roman soldiers. That's kind of like the human instinct, right, of what a Messiah should do. The Messiah should come and immediately overpower the enemy. That's kind of the impulse we all have, the immediate knee-jerk reaction, uh, which is actually a knee-jerk reaction that the disciples here would get rebuked for over and over and over again for the rest of Luke chapter 9. Do you remember, and we're gonna talk about this next week, in the transfiguration event, uh, Peter, he wanted to control how long Elijah and Moses would be chatting with Jesus, right? He built them a tent and said, hey, guys, you know, hang out longer here with us. Why? Because he was hoping that if the big three hang out long enough, you know, then maybe they'll decide to go ahead and fulfill this long-awaited messianic victory Right then and there, Peter said, look, we're all here. Let's go be some Romans. What are we waiting for? What did he want there? He wanted power. He wanted immediate control. He wanted, he wanted to call the shots. Then he got rebuked for that. And at the end of chapter 9, you know what the disciples are arguing about? They're arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And again, this pursuit for, for, for power, for autonomy, for authority, and they got rebuked for it again. And it's like over and over and over again, especially after Jesus revealed himself to be the Messiah he in, our, in our passage today, over and over again, the knee-jerk reaction for power and control seemed to flare up in the storyline. It's, it's almost like Luke was intentionally trying to contrast that as soon as Jesus was revealed as king, mankind's longing for autonomy and power began to squirm. And friends, lest we fall into foolish pride, are we not the same today? Are we not plagued by the pursuit of power and autonomy? Isn't that embedded in everything that we do? Why do we lie? We lie to gain autonomous power over the storyline, right? We want to control the narrative. We, we want to decide who's the hero, who's the villain, who's the victim. Why do we get addicted to things? What's addiction? If not autonomous power. You don't like how you feel? Addiction asks. You want to forget that memory? Finish another bottle. Take another hit. Scroll another hour. Why are we quick to anger? Why do leaders turn authority into abusive behavior? Why do hurt people often use their sadness to guilt trip other people? Power, control. Why do spouses turn the right given to them by their loved ones into coercive behavior? Power, control. Why do nations wage war against nations? Power, control. 
And I want to be careful not to say that any kind of power is bad, right? Because power in itself is just power. It's not good or bad. It's just a thing. But autonomous power, you see, this desire to gain it so that we can call the shot, so that we can control life and decide what's right and wrong for ourselves, for our own agendas, that's what the Bible is speaking against here. Just like the disciples who, whose knee-jerk reaction was to use Jesus for a military coup. It, it's a problem for all of us. Why? Because that was Adam's problem in the garden. The primordial voice that whispered in Adam's ear reverberates in ours still today. And it's asking us the same exact question it asked Adam in the garden. It's asking us, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want the power? Don't you want to decide for yourselves what to do? And ever since then, friends, our natural inclination, like Adam, is to say, yes, <laughs> I do. Since then, our knee-jerk reaction, like Adam, is to say, not God, but me. Me. And Jesus warns us here in verses 22 to 25, if you keep saying that, you'll die. If you keep saying that, you'll lose your life. But before we move on to verses 22 to 25, where Jesus unpacks this, let me just first point out how already we see here something unique about Christian self-denial, don't we, compared to the other versions of self-denial of other religions. See, the picture we get here isn't uh, some you know, religious leader telling us, you gotta deny yourself if you wanna be a more holy person and kinda earn God's favor, you gotta deny yourself. That's not what we see here. What we see here is more like a doctor telling a drug addict in a hospital bed, look, you gotta deny yourself. You gotta deny yourself. You keep, you keep shooting up power, you'll die. You gotta deny that knee-jerk reaction, that, that intuition that you have, because if you, if you just keep listening to what feels good to you, if you keep seeking autonomy, if you keep seeking power, you will lose your life. You're gonna die. Stop. And what you gotta do instead, Jesus says in verses 22 to 25, is you gotta reverse that sentence. You gotta switch it up. Instead of listening what naturally feels good to you and live by the sentence, not God but me, you gotta deny yourself. And you gotta live instead by the sentence, not me, but God. Not me, but God. Which leads us to our third point, where Jesus calls his disciples to quench their impulse for power. Do not live by the sentence, not God but me, but instead live by the sentence, not me, but God. And if you do that, here's what life will look like for you. Jesus says in verse 22, when you live by that sentence, you will suffer many things. Jesus says, just like me. Look at verse 22. Jesus says, the son of man, in other words, him, um, I will suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day, I'll be raised. When you live by the sentence, not me but God, the world will hate you for it. You're gonna find yourself brushing shoulders with people. You're gonna find yourself stepping on people's toes. Why? Because most people in the world don't live by that same sentence. Most people will be living by the sentence, not God, but me. And they're not gonna like you for switching it up on them. Some of them may even get really, really mad. They'll kill you for it. 
just like they did to me. Jesus says in verse 22. And it's gonna be really hard for you to keep living by that sentence because the world's gonna hate you, but not only that, your own natural inclination, your own addictions for autonomous power is gonna flare up every now and then. But you gotta deny it. You gotta carry your cross, Jesus says in verse 23. Now, why did Jesus choose the imagery of the cross here? Because the cross back then represented the idea of utter submission, total submission. A commentary I used for this passage said that back then, cross-bearing was a visible public affair that visualized a person's humility before the state. Thus, the fundamental idea here is of submitting to the authority of another. In this case, not the state, but God. Cross-bearing means that one's independent, autonomous life is at an end. It's at an end. To live under the banner, not me but God, it will feel like self-denying death to you and to me. But you gotta remember, it's a good and a healthy self-denying death. It's the kind that alcoholics feel every time they say no to the bottle and yes to life. It's the kind drug addicts feel every time they refuse the urge to shoot up and choose life. And you gotta do this daily. Jesus says at the end of verse 23, daily. Every single day, when you wake up, your heart is gonna intuitively tell you that today, I'll be calling the shots. Thank you very much. That today, I'll react to this person however I want to. That today, I'll forgive whoever I wanna forgive. That today, my imaginations will go wherever it wants to. That today, I'm gonna use my time and my money and my words the way I wanna use my time, my money, and my words, and no one has anything to do about it. Daily, every single day when you wake up, you must deny that urge. It's an addiction birthed in the fall. And if you keep feeding it, you will die. Now, let me, let me just say this. I do realize how a lot of grace-based, gospel-centered Christians, which I hope we all are, would hear something like this, and they would think to themselves, man, that just sounds really legalistic, right? It's like, Jesus said that if I don't deny myself, I will die, I'll lose my life. That doesn't sound very grace-based at all. I thought salvation in Christianity was all about grace. I thought salvation in Christianity was all about um, faith in Christ alone, uh, not about self-denial. Well, let me ask you to think about it this way, okay? When you say the words, I'm saved by grace alone through Christ alone, not through my personal efforts, not through my own morality, not through my performance, not through my strength, not through my religious accomplishments, not, not me, but by God's grace alone, you know what it is you're saying at that moment? You're already at that moment saying, not me, but God. You're already self-denying. The grace-based gospel of Christianity is not antithetical to the idea of self-denial. It is self-denial. See, the self-denial that a Christian does after they get saved 
is simply an organic continuation of the self-denial that they did at the moment they got saved. <laughs> you see? So it's not, you know, a grace, salvation by grace alone and then self-denial in our sanctification, in our growth. It's rather, by God's grace, you were able to self-deny both in your salvation till the day you die. You see that? And here we find another distinction, by the way, between Christian self-denial and every other religious self-denial. In every other religions, they would say that self-denial is some sort of way to earn or to maintain your salvation, right? If you obey God, you'll get saved. Or uh, it's more likely that you'll get saved at the very least. But in Christianity, self-denial isn't a way to earn or maintain salvation. Self-denial is simply the natural, organic continuation of our salvation. Or the biblical word for it is that it is the fruit of our salvation. By God's grace, you'll continue to say, not me, but God, every day after you got saved. Because by God's grace, you were able to say, not me, but God, when you got saved. It's a whole packet of God's grace. A beautiful doctrine of God's grace. But one that brings with it scary implications, which Jesus addresses here at the end of our passage. And the scary implication is this. What if one day you stop self-denying? What if one day you stop saying, uh, not me but God, and you go back to living your life under the sentence, not God, but me, what then? Well, let's go to our last point. Jesus wants his disciples here to see what'll happen if their lust for control and power isn't quenched. What'll happen? Okay, so we gotta briefly talk about this weird last sentence that Jesus says at the end of the passage. It's gonna feel like I'm going on a tangent, but I'll bring it back to the sermon, okay? But stick with me for a bit. Jesus says here at the end of our passage, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. They'll not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, okay, what in the world does that mean? So we have to know that when the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God, okay, it's not always referring to the future kingdom of God like, like heaven when Christ comes again the second time. All right, it, not necessarily. For example, especially in the book of Luke, sometimes the kingdom of God is described to have already come. You heard that sentences in, in the gospels, right? You go to Luke chapter 17, verse 21, for example. Jesus says, behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's already here. But sometimes the kingdom of God is about to come. Like, not, it's not now, but it's soon, but it's not like too far away later either. So Luke 21, verse 31, for example, Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, it's nigh. And sometimes he does refer to the kingdom of God that's gonna come later. So you gotta know what time frame is being referred to when it talks about the kingdom of God, okay? The kingdom of God is just this generic phrase that describes a time period where Jesus reigns as king, okay? With the king comes the kingdom. So let me ask you, is Jesus reigning as king here in Luke chapter nine as he's talking to the disciples? Yes or no? I mean, kind of, right? He has some authority. He uh, uh, expels the demons. He heals diseases, things like that. So there's some authority, um, but not quite fully yet. Like later, he says, now I have the authority, I have all authority over heaven and earth. When does he say that? Do you remember? We talked about this a few, a few weeks ago. The Great Commission. Remember that? When he resurrected and he said, now I have all authority over heaven and earth. But it's still not full authority yet until Jesus comes again the second time, then his kingdom will truly come, okay? So, I know that's confusing. Just put that at the back of your head somewhere. Let me go back to the passage. In our passage today, 
When Jesus says, truly, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Which time period of the kingdom of God do you think he was referring to here? Well, it can't be the immediate kingdom of God that's already here, right? Because Jesus said, some of you are gonna die. And obviously, they're all still alive at that point, right? So he's not talking about the kingdom of God that's currently there with him. And he's obviously not talking about the kingdom of God that's gonna come like way longer later in the future when he comes a second time, because at that point, not only some of them will be dead, but all of them will be dead, right? So he can't be referring to that one either. So which one is he referring to then? Option two, the soon. One day, on the third day, he says in our passage, I will resurrect. And at that point, all authority over heaven and earth will be given to me. And the kingdom will truly be inaugurated. And at that point, when I resurrect, some of you would not have tasted death. But by implication there, some of you would die. Who's Jesus talking about here? Who out of the 12 disciples would be dead by the time he's resurrected? Judas. Now let me bring it back to the passage, okay? See, Judas looked like he was living his life under the banner, not me, but God. Oh, he looked like a Christian. He fooled everyone, maybe even himself. But time will always tell. Time will always prove who's really living by the sentence, not me, but God. And who, like Judas, only looked like they were on the outside. But internally, they're actually still saying, not God, but me. Time will tell whose self-denial was real and whose self-denial was fake. How about us here today, friends? Most of us here, I assume, would claim to have already said, not me, but God, at least in regards to our salvation, right? Meaning most of us here, I assume, believe that we're saved not by our own efforts, but by God's mercy, not me, but God. Great. You've denied yourself in your salvation a long time ago. But the question posed at the end of our passage today is are you still denying yourself now? Are you still saying, not me, but God, today? And you gotta be totally honest with yourself. Because if you're not saying it now, that could be a sign that you never actually said it back then. Because remember, the Christian self-denial today is simply an organic continuation of the self-denial that happened to them the moment they were saved. You can't have one without the other. You'll know a tree by its what? Fruit. Don't be like Judas, who only looked like a Christian externally, but never actually was. Because if you're like him, Jesus says in verse 26, with a chilling warning, I will reject you the day I come in my glory. Okay, hold on. Does that mean, Tez, that I have to deny myself, you know, from the day I got saved, every single day without fail until I die in order to not be rejected by Jesus? No, that is not what this means. How do we know that? 
Because, remember, who else in our text today denied Jesus as well, aside from Judas? <laughs> Peter did. The disciple who so boldly confessed that Jesus is the Christ of God, he denied Jesus too, didn't he? Just like Judas. But what's the difference? And if you don't get anything from the sermon today, I do pray you get this. What's the difference? The difference was, after Judas failed and sinned, he never got back to saying, not me, but God. He kept on saying, not God, but me. Not God's righteousness, but my failures. Not God's grace, but my shame. Not God's mercy, but my imperfections. He kept saying, not God, but me, so he died in self-pity. But Peter, you see, failed the same failure as Judas. But yet after he failed, he was able to say, not me, but God. Yes, I failed. Yes, I sinned. Yes, I'm shamed. Yes, I'm flawed. Yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I'm imperfect. But it's not about me. It's about God. It's not about my righteousness. It's not about my holiness. It's not about my immorality. It's about God's mercy and God's grace and God's patience and God's perseverance and God's long suffering to hold on to his people until he sees them face to face. He switched the sentence. So you know what happened? He bounced back. He bounced back, unlike Judas, he didn't drown in his own sorrows. He turned his gaze upon Calvary and continued to deny himself for the rest of his life. That's the difference. Friends, when you fail to deny your passions and disobey God's commands, you must immediately deny your own righteousness and trust in God's mercy. Do not let your godly sorrows turn into self-fixated guilt. Do not let your healthy regrets to turn into self-mortifying shame. In your lowest moments, reverse the sentence and tell Satan what Adam should have said, not me. God. Jesus died, so you can say that. Friends, Jesus could have sought immediate power, couldn't he, if he wanted to. Uh, he could have woken up any day during the cross event and say, you know what? Today, I'll be calling the shots. <laughs> you know what? Today, I'll react to these people however I want to react to them. You know what? Today, I'll forgive whoever I want to forgive and perform a military coup and tell Peter to keep swinging his sword and call legions of angels to come and rescue me. I could. He could have, but he didn't. He didn't. He denied the serpent's whisper and he told his Father in heaven, not my will, but yours be done. Why? So that he can bear a cross for you. What road are you on, friends? The road of cross denial or self denial? You keep going down that first road, you will die. You will lose your life. But if you go down that second road and you deny yourself, both in your salvation and for the rest of your life, that road 
though death it may feel like, will result in resurrection life. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for every day waking up and saying, not you, but me. Forgive us for seeking the things that Adam sought, the classic mistake we all fall into every day. Help us today, Father, as we behold your son who denied himself and said on that cross, not my will but yours be done, be an encouragement and a life for us to do the same, not because we like pain, not because we just wanna be better people, but because we're addicted to something we're not supposed to be addicted to, and to seek what is good and healthy, to seek life, it'll feel like self-denial. Help us do so, Father, by the strength of your spirit, by the power of your gospel, and by the patience of your hand that you may carry us along until we see you again and see him who denied himself for our sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.